Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living, Victoria Online. If you're here with us for the first time today, my name is Carrie Hunter, and I'm the Spiritual Director of the Center, and it's a real pleasure to have you join us. And for those of you who are regulars, it's great to have you back here today, too. It'll only be two more weeks, and we will be physically together in our new facility, and it will be really, really wonderful to see everyone in person again. So today I continue with um, the story of the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy and Toto and um, Scarecrow, Tin Man, the Lion, they're well on their way down the Yellow Brick Road. And the Wicked Witch of the West has been watching them from her dark castle and she watches them through a crystal ball and she can see that they're coming close to accomplishing their objective, which is to get to the Emerald City to meet the Wizard of Oz so that they can each have their wishes granted. Dorothy wants to go home to Kansas, the Scarecrow wants a brain, the Tin Man wants a heart, and the Lion wants courage. And little Toto, well, Toto's just along uh, keep, keeping Dorothy company and really being a messenger uh, for her during this time. Anyway, they're going along the road. The witch is really upset because she can see that they're very, very close to the Emerald City. And so she decides she's going to cast a spell upon them. She wants it to be something poisonous. And of course, it's only going to affect those who actually have flesh and blood, which is an interesting part of this story. Um, she decides that she's going to cast a spell where she sends out this vast poppy field absolutely gorgeous poppies. And as Dorothy and her entourage are walking along the yellow brick road, skipping along, singing, dancing, all of a sudden they come across this glorious field of poppies. And it, the, the poppies even cover the yellow brick road as they're going along. And as they're moving on through them and, and admiring them, they, they kind of get sleepy. And Dorothy and Lion and Toto reach the point where they they just feel like they they can't go on. They're exhausted, and so they lie down to have a little nap. Anyway, they they're sound asleep, and you know I think this is such an amazing metaphor for life when we think about it. This whole story of of the Wizard of Oz. I don't know if it was ever intended that way, but when we look at it and look at the various parts of it, there's so many metaphors in it. How often when we have some wonderful goal, some wonderful dream, and we're moving toward it and we're working and we're just filled with passion and, and we, have, we have all of the energy that we need to do what it is that we want to do. And sometimes the going gets tough. You know, Dorothy and her friends have had their problems along the yellow brick road. And so we have our challenges sometimes in our lives too. Sometimes the going gets tough. And when that happens, we have the choice to push on through, even though we might be exhausted, or to take a little rest, or to divert ourselves in some other way. And it's really such a common thing to look for the diversion. You know, instead of just working on that right now, maybe I'll just go to the beach, or maybe I'll go shopping, or maybe I'll watch TV, or play a video game, or do something else to distract me, to entertain myself. That's basically sleeping in the poppy field. It's, it's ignoring what it is that's right there for us to do right at that time. And what happens as we keep doing that is we start to lose focus of what it is that we're dreaming about, of what it is that we really want to accomplish. And we may fool ourselves that we're just, you know, just taking a little rest, just a little diversion from what we're doing and we'll get back to it. But the more often we do that, the harder it is to get back to it. The more we kind of fall asleep, we forget who we are. We forget our dreams. We're, we're so focused on the material world around us that we forget our inner life. We forget our inner world. We forget that we are supported by this vast power this, and that we have this higher consciousness with which to create what we want much more easily when we're really in tune with it. We don't have to work so hard. But as we lose track of that, Things get harder and harder, and we need something to wake us up. And you know, I've been thinking a lot about that the last two weeks with what's been going on in America 
after the, the death of George Floyd. And of course, he's just one of a few who were recently murdered um, by police officers or by, by others. And the protests that have been going on have been about, about his murder specifically and about the police officers who were involved. And it's like everybody had been asleep for a long time. And I was thinking of the civil rights movement and what little I knew about it at the time and, and, and what I've read about it since. But how Martin Luther King led protesters, peaceful protesters, and he, he said they would not fight, even though they, some of them were bludgeoned to death. He said that they, they were going to march in peace. He and Gandhi, that that peaceful, peaceful nature, that that's the way that we have to do things. And so there were protesters in the streets. And of course, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And there were, there were riots. There was terrible mourning. And there were some things that came of that. Um, up until that time, African Americans were really segregated. They couldn't go to the same schools as white children could. I remember seeing television footage or video footage of Bobby Kennedy when he was Attorney General of the United States escorting a, a little black child into a white school and there were armed guards all around. That was an, an historical moment when Rosie Parks sat on the front seat of a bus rather than going to the back of the bus where African Americans were supposed to be. When people could go into, when African American people could go into restaurants and sit where white folks sat. When they could drink out of the same drinking fountains, when they could go into the same bathrooms. Shocking, absolutely shocking to believe that those times existed. And of course, before that, the horrors of slavery. But something happened at, that, at the time of the Civil Rights Movement. People woke up for a while and change was made. But the thing is that it wasn't the inherent change that needed to be made. It wasn't something that changed racism in America forever. It just allowed some privileges to African Americans that they had not enjoyed before that time. And then it's as if Everybody just fell asleep again. Same with us in Canada, with our own issues that we have here, although they don't seem as great as what goes on in the US. And it was the death of George Floyd, the, the murder of George Floyd, that brought the world's attention to the matter. The technology, of course, having, having video on our cell phones now has been enormous. The impact has been enormous. Those things didn't exist during the civil rights movement. And to see this man murdered in cold blood, you know, I think it was eight minutes and 40, 46 seconds that a police officer held his knee against George Floyd's throat. And two other officers held him down and one other stood by and watched it happen. It's, it brought us to our knees. It cracked our hearts open. I have shed more tears, I think, in the last two weeks than I can remember shedding in a long, long time. That this kind of thing could happen. It's the power of the media, the power of technology today. And as I prayed for George Floyd and for his family, for those who loved him, as I prayed for the American people, I remembered the Vietnam War. And there was a photograph, I think it was in Life magazine at the time, but it's been reproduced many times since. And it was a little eight-year-old girl running naked from napalm in Vietnam. That little girl is now an adult woman living in Canada. But at the time, it just showed her running along the road with, with her arms up and she was screaming. And it broke hearts everywhere. And it was a photograph that changed the direction of the Vietnam War and eventually brought it to an end because there seemed to be nothing that was going to end it before that. And so my prayer was with, with George Floyd's death that this video is that moment in history, that moment that will always be defined as the time that America changed for the better. And it's different 
I mean, the, the marches during the civil, li civil rights movement were almost all black people. As we look at the marches now in the streets throughout American cities, there are many, many white people who are marching with, with African Americans. And in some cases, police officers are kneeling and asking for forgiveness. In others, they're not. In others, they're brutalizing people. But the thing is that something different is happening. It's what Al Sharpton called, it's a new season. A new season in the history of the United States, a new season in the lives of the African American people. I think that, you know, so many of the people who are marching are very young and they have that passion and they have that indignance, indignity for, for what's happened. They're outraged. Many of us are outraged. I think probably everybody is outraged by what we have seen. But these young people have the energy to be out there protesting and they want to see a different world and they can't understand why things are the way that they are. And frankly, nor can I but I've been sleeping. And I think that most of America was sleeping, sleeping in the poppy fields, you know, just assuming that life was going on as life was going on. And every once in a while, there was some horrible police incident, but it didn't get a lot of attention. This is a different moment. This is George Floyd's legacy to humanity. As we all have to search within our souls to see where we have been sleeping, to see if there's something that we have been ignoring, to reawaken ourselves, to allow our spiritual selves to come forward courageously and with great energy and compassion and wisdom to do the right thing. It's time. It's absolutely time for that. And so I see this metaphor of, of America, of the world being asleep and waking up at this time. And it's a time when, you know, we need to ask ourselves what it is that we might do. There's a paradigm shift going on. History is being made right in this moment. We're watching it unfolding. We don't quite know where it's going, um, but, but we, we are praying. We're praying that this is going to be a change that is going to be a really big one where people are declared to truly be equal with one another. And, you know, it can be frustrating. We, we might sometimes say, well, you know, there's so much to do and I'm only one person. What can I do? And what Ernest Holmes reminds us to do is, is gather around us those of like mind gather around so that we are together with people of like consciousness. That's where it all begins. It begins in consciousness. And together, let us envision a better world. And then as we pray, let's move our feet. Let us take action. Let us determine what we, even as a small group of people, might be able to do to make a difference. And that may just mean something like educating ourselves better. God knows we can use that. You know, I, my, my, I was talking to my daughter, uh, Kendall, a couple of days ago, and, and I was taught, we were both just distraught by what's going on. And I was reminding her that when I lived in Vancouver, it is such a cosmopolitan city that I didn't define my friends by what color they were or what race they were. I never really thought about it. You know, I just said they, they were just my friends. I mean, there's so many people of every different nationality, every different race, every color. It wasn't something that I ever gave a lot of thought to. And she said, Mom, for goodness sake, don't be colorblind. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, don't be colorblind. She said, it is really important to acknowledge people of every color, of every culture, to acknowledge who they are, to acknowledge the color of their skin, to acknowledge their culture, to acknowledge what it is that they have gone through, what their challenges have been. Because if you don't, then you're just going to act as if their lives have been the same as yours. You have to absolutely stop being colorblind. And she really stopped me in my tracks. That had never occurred to me that 
because I didn't think about the color of my friends or the race of my friends or even the religion of most of them, I, I wasn't privy to a whole lot of information about their history, about the challenges that they have had in their lives. And she said, if we're really going to be awake, we need to do this. Now, my daughter spent quite a bit of time working in South Africa as a photojournalist, and she has traveled to developing countries around the world, so she has a much deeper understanding of how deep racism can be than many, many people do. But I, I had to think long and hard about that, and I was so grateful to her. And I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed that that I had ignored these things, that I hadn't asked those friends about what things they might have suffered earlier in their lives. And lately I've seen young people in Victoria interviewed on television, young black women who have said that their voices have never been heard because they are black. They can't get the same kinds of jobs that other people can because they are black. And I was astonished. I mean, first of all, we live in a very vanilla area. I haven't seen very many people of color um, in this in this area. It's not that they don't exist, it's just that we don't see them every day when we're out and about. And so it's really made me more thoughtful about wanting to wanting to go deeper into my spiritual self, to have more empathy with them and to find out more about them, to educate myself. Because for me, that's where it all begins. And I was reminded of my early days um, as a, a young journalist. I was working for the Calgary Herald and I was a feature writer and then I moved to Banff. And in Banff I became what was known as the stringer uh, from Banff for the Calgary Herald, which meant that I basically covered all the news in Banff, all the conventions, all of the things that were going on in town. And once a week I would stop in at the local RCMP office because Banff was governed at that time by the RCMP. Actually, it still is. And uh, the sergeant who was in charge there was just a lovely guy. He was, he was just a warm, friendly man, um, drop-dead gorgeous, uh, looked like a young Clark Gable wearing his red serge because in those days the Mounties wore their red serge and tourists were always wanting to have their photographs taken with them. And, you know, we used to joke about it. But at that time, um, young people, and still, young people come from all over the world practically to, to work in Banff for a summer and now to even work longer, but summer was the real season when, when the, a lot of staff came from elsewhere. And a lot of these kids were pretty young. It was their first time away from home, and they partied and they drank a lot. They were in bars with fake ID. And, uh, you know, we, we knew it was happening, but nobody really gave it a lot of thought because they knew the kids were going back to school in the fall, going back to their families, and probably life would get back to what their normal was at home. The thing is, there were, there were a lot of First Nations people who were in town at night, a lot of men, and they tended to drink a lot at the time. Now, the, the closest reservation to, to Banff is basically halfway between Banff and Calgary. And the, the people of that nation were not well educated. They didn't have adequate housing. They didn't have adequate medical care. Um, they had all kinds of problems. The land that they lived on was basically not good for planting anything. They couldn't grow gardens. Um, you know, it was kind of dusty grassland. Strange place to to have a reservation, and they didn't have a choice in it. And I know I used to go to the Banff Hospital and, and help out with children in the children's ward in the winter months. And um, there were little Aboriginal children, their babies, um, up to basically two years old. And one of the nurses told me that they kept them there for the winter because they were concerned that if they went back to their families that they would get pneumonia and die. Uh, uh, it's incomprehensible during this time, this time that that kind of thing could have ever happened. And the thing is that the, um, the um, RCMP sergeant said that um, when the new young police officers arrived in the summer months, they were really wet behind the ears. They had, they had just graduated. 
and they were sent to Banff for their first summer think, because it was thought to be a, a pretty easy place to be. And without fail, every night they would arrest a few First Nations people and bring them into the, into the, um, into the office, into the jail. And um, my friend, the police sergeant, said that he would send the, the young guys out and tell them to, you know, just go and monitor the town. And he would give, um, he would give the men who'd been brought in a cup of coffee and would send them out and send them home. Um, and and he, he's, he never arrested them. He never put them in jail overnight. He just sent them out. And he had a lot of compassion. He was very loving. He was very understanding to a certain level. And I thought, you know, well, that's great. You know, he, he's, he's not doing anything abusive. And I was very young. And I'm ashamed of myself now for not knowing better. Because truly, truly, if, if, if I were there now, I would be saying to him, something needs to be done about this. You know, these people do not have enough education, they don't have enough food, they don't have enough clothing, they don't have medical care, they don't have proper housing. There, there is illness there. What can we do to help? How can we organize with them, not against them, or not organize as white folks saying, well, let's go and be do-gooders and, uh, and do something for them. How can we bring them into a dialogue with us so that we can understand fully what's going on with them. How can we meet with them to find out what it is that has them in the parks at night drinking? What is it that, that has been going on in their lives that gives them such great sadness? I mean, we know about the residential schools now. Um, we know about some of the horrific things that happened. I wasn't aware of those things then. I don't know if you were. I'm talking about you know, late 60s in Banff, um, and I, I just was totally ignorant a lot of a lot of these things. The thing is that when we see these things happening, I know now I have a responsibility to do something, and that something is to walk in the other person's shoes or in the other person's moccasins. It's to understand them, and we can't understand them if we think that they're exactly the same as we are and treat them the same way as we are being treated. They all deserve to be treated well, but they also need to be understood because we need to know how to remove racism from society. We need to, to know how to recognize that each person is a beloved child of God. I'm not talking about some man in the sky who created somebody out of dust of the earth and created women out of or woman out of the ribs of the rib of Adam. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff, about the romanticized stories that are in the Bible. And there are some wonderful stories in there that we can use as metaphors in our lives. But I'm talking about us all being created from the same stuff. You know, as some scientists have said, as some astronauts have said, we're all created out of stardust. You know, we're all created out of that quantum particle that brought us into being. We're all one. We're all one with spirit. It is that energy, that intelligence that I call God. And we are all one with one another because we are all made out of that. And so we all deserve to be treated well. We all deserve to live a good life. And the way that we're going to do that and help others is to live in higher consciousness to be consciously aware of what it is that is going on and to really understand that this racism runs deep and to examine our own hearts and souls and see if is it there in us somewhere? Is there anyone we turn away from? Is there anyone that we wouldn't invite into our own lives? That shows us, if there is, it shows us that we have to take some action with ourselves, with our own consciousness. But also, it's an invitation for social responsibility. It's an invitation for us to show the truth of who we are, that we are spirit having a human experience, and that we are here to love one another, and that we are here to make a difference. I don't know if any of you watched some of the memorial service for George Floyd. Um, I, I only saw 
a clip of it later in the day and on the news and uh, and the eulogy that was delivered by Reverend Al Sharpton and I was absolutely gobsmacked by it um, and I, I printed it out I'm going to just read a little bit of it to you he said no peace no justice and of course that has been on a lot of the signs that um, protesters have been carrying as they have marched in in various American cities no peace no justice we have to have peace to have justice and we can't have police officers murdering people um, you know things simmered down only slightly when the four police officers were arrested and charged with well, one with second degree murder and the other three with aiding, aiding and abetting second de degree murder the protests continue but still it was it was something that was done there's a lot more there's a lot more to happen yet so no peace no justice and and Reverend Sha Sh Reverend Sharpton who likes to be called just Rev said this is a different time and a different season time has run out for empty words and empty promises we're going to keep going until we change the system of justice there was a season of time when we lost hope but there is something that is a sister to hope and that's faith faith is a substance of hope the evidence of things unseen faith is the evidence of things unseen of God the invisible that dwells within us that is in everyone and everything faith is the evidence of things unseen we didn't come this far by luck faith is a substance of hope we came this far by faith leaning on God trusting in the Holy Word it has never yet failed me from the outhouse to the White House we have come a long way it was one of those hand clapping foot stomping moments with amen and hallelujahs with people people standing um, in the church during the service and shouting out those people are awake and I came across a quote of Carl Jung's he said your visions will become clear only when you can look into your own heart those who look outside dream those who look inside awake and so we're called to be looking inside ourselves right now you know we've wakened up out of the poppy field this time let us hope let us pray and as I said last week Canada is not immune from these things I heard on the news the other day that a police officer in Edmonton was kneeling on the throat of a black man he didn't kill him but he was kneeling on his throat too when he apprehended him this is happening here as well we just don't see it in the news every night we don't see videos of it but we need to be outraged as well and we need to be calling upon the God of our being for change and for understanding in our own hearts and souls and for giving up any traces of racism but for educating ourselves so that we really really understand what it is that people of color are going through and have been going through in our country and in other places in the world and when we do let us get together in dialogue and sit together and foster greater understanding and see what we can do to understand one another isn't that the least that we can do we call ourselves spiritual beings we really need to understand that this is all about love you know we have to love ourselves and that's a, a tough thing for most of us to kind of get our, our minds around but we have to love ourselves through feelings of shame as I've been feeling shame about my lack of understanding my limited understanding we have to forgive ourselves for that and and decide that we're going to be better than that and love is part of that and then we have to love one another because if we love one another then we are open to 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 understanding what is in another person's heart and then 
we need to love all of humanity. We need to expand our worldview and honor our interconnectedness with everyone and with everything. And we need to love spirit. We need to love spirit, God, the universe, this intelligence, this creative power that is love itself. You know, as Ernest Holmes wrote, love points the way and the law makes it happen. Well, it's the law of cause and effect. The way that we think and what we put our passion behind is what we're manifesting in our lives. And so let us together rise up in love at this time, in love and compassion for all humanity. And let us speak our love and speak it again and speak it still once again. And let us embrace our brothers and sisters of every race and every culture and do what we can to raise our own consciousness and to give them a safer place to be so that they feel heard in this society in which we live and bring peace to the hearts of people everywhere and create a better system of justice, justice that works for all just not for some of us because of the color of our skin. This is an historic moment in our lives. This is a time when the energy, the vibration is incredibly high for us to all make a difference. Let us pray together. Let us stay together. Let us meditate. Let us see if there is something that we can do to make a big difference here and now. It's time. This is our time. This is the time that the world has been waiting for, and God bless George Floyd. God bless him and his soul, and God bless his family. Let us send them our love and our prayers and see that he did not die in vain. Let us see that this brings about real change in America and in our own country and throughout the world. When our hearts are broken, they are cracked wide open. And that's the time we can let the love out and just love everybody into, into a different existence, a different way of being. Love unites us. It gives us strength when we're weary. It gives us courage. It wakes us up from the poppy fields and directs us toward a higher and better life. Let us wake up now. Let us commit to that. God bless you all. I send my love to you all. And so it is. And thank you for going to the top of our page if you're on our um, website and making a donation to us today. It's what keeps us going during this pandemic. And uh, if you're not on our web page, which is www.csl.org, I invite you to visit that page and make a contribution. Or you can send a check to the address that's on our website or an e-transfer to welcome at cslvictoria.org. No gift is too small. We appreciate them all. And it's only two weeks until we have our first Sunday together in our new, in our new home. And we will be social distancing and taking every precaution that we can gather together safely and uh, enjoy one another's company again as we acknowledge the one God that is in every one of us and reunite with one another physically in the same way that we are united spiritually. Thanks for being with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. And so it is. Blessings. <laughs>